Hey, Rich, you there? I can't see you. Oh, it asked me again to share, even though I had to share. Yeah, how you doing? Hey, hopefully everyone can see and hear us. I can see and hear you. I mean, do we need anybody else? I guess not. I mean, yeah, you and I can just hang out. It's good. Sorry, uh, yeah, if uh, everyone can see and hear us, uh, we'll get started. I apologize for starting late. We had uh, multiple different technical issues, uh, which is always fun. Yeah, apologies. That was my fault. I got a new computer and it's really nice, but I had to redo all my privacy settings. Ah, no worries. Uh, all righty. So we're ready to get started and talk about cloud security architecture with none other than Mr. Rich Mogul. I'm, of course, Paul Asadorian. Uh, the I work here at Security Weekly, of course. Uh, Rich, you've got a, a relatively new gig at, uh, at Firemon. If you uh, got an official title there, right? They acquired your company. Yeah, it, it took a while, but I do. I am the SVP of cloud security. Very nice. Very nice. And you yeah. started playing with this cloud stuff like really early. Yeah, about 2008, 2009, I think. I need to go go back and check my accounts. But it was uh, super early days on AWS. Azure wasn't even a thing yet. Um, mm. Amazon didn't have IAM. It was kind of like EC2 and S3 and a, a couple of other basic things when we uh, when we were in our first class that I built on that. Well, what are some of the the biggest changes, you know, while we're on that that subject, Rich, and kind of segue into like if you wanted to create an application today, the the choices you have are, are staggering, right? But what's been some of the major developments? Yeah, you know, it, it's really been wild to watch the evolution. So sometimes when you know, I, I tell people when I I get in all the cloud security stuff and they see over seem overwhelmed, how do you know all this stuff? It's like, dude, I got to start when it was the Commodore sixty four, and like. Now we're on the x86 is like I learned yeah. to grow my skills as the complexity went up. Uh, and the the changes have been really massive. Uh, in the early days, it was very much just kind of a developer thing as we were figuring all of this out. Uh, so like uh, EC2 instances on Amazon were a found. So there was no you had no long term storage, uh, I think, you know, for a very short time when I first started it. And then they added. Uh, longer term storage. There was no private cloud options to link into your data centers. And then they did that. But VPCs were like this fully private thing over here. Uh, and then the um, uh, and then the Amazon public network was over here and there was no way to connect the two things together except mm -hmm. literally route the traffic through your data center. Right, uh, right. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. So we've gone from, you know, that being the early days to uh, it becoming enterprise focus versus developer focused mm -hmm. uh, and then of course we've got the you know the additions of uh, you know now there there's Amazon uh, Azure and Google plus there's others I mean you know Oracle pops up every now and then still uh, I think IBM has mostly disappeared uh, in terms of the, the questions that I get from people that if you don't work in China it's Alibaba uh, you know there's a bunch of these other other kinds of things that are out there but the um, it what I would say the biggest differences are is we've gone from a handful of services to hundreds of services on each cloud provider. And they keep abstracting more and more out to enable enterprises to be very agile, uh, to not have to manage everything themselves. I and mean, we now have serverless and you know, heck, you go to Amazon and uh, you know, they've got satellite telemetry as a service. Mm -hmm. now, you know, it's kind of some of the things that are built in there. One of, one of the concerns, Rich, and you know, most of us listening are security practitioners in, in some capacity, we have this hesitation to allow our developers to be creating infrastructure. And I think that's yeah. a legacy thing, right? We, we used to be, if you were a sysadmin or network admin, right, you were racking and stacking the gear and the developers were responsible for software and you were responsible for systems. Obviously that convergence of DevOps brought about this fear i think we all have of allowing developers because it reminded me of this is when you said back in the day it was for developers developers now today can really create their own infrastructure or create code without really having to worry about the infrastructure is that still a concern yeah so you nailed something on the head which is uh okay so this is like draft research i'm working on right now and i'm still figuring out the exact wording of it 
Uh, and you know, one of the things in my, one of the reasons I was given the role at, at, at work is come up, put my analyst hat on and come up with kind of a vision for where are we going? And then let's, you know, and the other half of it is, is as a company, let's have an opinion about that. Uh, and so I'm wrapping a lot of stuff into this bigger theme of digital transformation, even though I hate that term. Yeah. Uh, it turns out a lot of companies are using that term to describe like zero trust plus cloud plus 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 these other technology wrapper thingies. On the cloud side, the okay, so you, man, you've known me for a long time now. Um, you know I can get a little big in my own head. Uh, I'm calling it the Grand Unified Theory of Cloud Governance. Ooh, and fancy title. This exactly addresses what you said, and so the. The three postules of the Grand Unified Theory of Cloud Governance are, you know, number one is cloud removes all gatekeepers and choke points mm -hmm. and is inherently distributed. And I'll, I'll go into more of that in a moment after I kind of walk through the framework. Uh, but that is exactly what you brought up. So I mean, clearly I, I put a weird name on it. Everybody knows this. Um, number two is that we have unified the administrative interfaces for our data centers into a single web console and a single API. Mm -hmm. Number three is, is we put that on the internet and we protected it with the username and password. Mm -hmm. And so if I look at all the governance and security changes, not all the security changes, like I can get all the details of like networking yeah. stuff, and we're gonna do that, like, you know, I mean, I, I know you have some specific questions about some architectural options and stuff. But if we, we look at that bigger picture, we've lost the choke points, we unified everything, and we put it on the internet with the username and password. So we distribute it and centralized simultaneously. We distributed ownership, but centralized management, or the management interface, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and this creates all sorts of cascading issues outside of that. Uh, you know, the reason we got here is that a lot of what we do in security has always been inherently tied to, uh, oops, I thought I had everything on mute here and maybe not. So let me go ahead and get that. Right. I did the but, same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So the, if you think about it, like our data centers are data centers and you're not going to have the developers running around plugging in wires because that was special knowledge and they're not going to be mm -hmm. putting in routers. And they're not going to be configuring servers because they're there to develop. That's their job. And so we built all of these like organizational structures and silos. Uh, and the term I've used is form follows function. Uh, it was because just the these were it was an emergent natural evolution just based on what a data center was and what an office network was. That's like where we that was our starting point. Uh, and so of course we had to have all the different teams doing the different things. And then compliance came in, and then security was hard and you couldn't just have the network operators dealing with it all the time so we added security teams and i mean heck i when i first started working in, in our field like it was debatable if CISO was going to be a consistent role in most organizations mm -hmm. so we started from there and we did what we needed to do like nothing wrong it's not like we made mistakes we built something to match that environment that was our operating environment the cloud has upended that so there are no choke points because you don't need a server team for a server and you don't need a network team to build a network and all the stuff that you brought up moments ago, which is inherently like, oh God, for us is security. And then to make it worse, we put everything out on the internet and we protect it with a username and password. Right. And then in any case, we even allow them to make their own usernames and passwords and they get to decide developers day. I don't like us versus them stuff, but our development teams, the cloud account owners had to make out a bunch of these decisions uh, you know, in terms of how they want to implement this stuff themselves, largely because we didn't know what we were doing, we didn't support them. Mm -hmm. but that's where we are or where we were. And then now I think we're starting to come out of that curve with understanding security practices. So my, you know, my fundamental thoughts, and this is the stuff I wrapped up into to digital, the digital transformation theme a little bit more was, so this is cool. I'm testing this this stuff out. You tell me what you think. But you know, number one would be all all organizations are moving to cloud. But number two is they're not moving everything to cloud. Mm -hmm. Three is all organizations are supporting remote workers. But four is they're not only supporting remote workers. And there's a few other kind of things out there. So what does this mean to us as security? Well, I think that cloud 
needs its own governance model. But we also need to still support our on-premise governance models. Like these things need to be able to work together mm -hmm. because we're not getting rid of the data centers. And remote work needs a its own governance model or zero trust, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think that's a that's a loaded term these days. And then, but we still need to support offices. And so this is why we're all like struggling with these issues, like you brought up. Uh, I think from as you know, as a security pro, I mean, I'm I'm shooting for the future. I'm more interested in the other stuff. Uh, of course, I just started working for a company that most of our income is from the data center side of things. So I have yeah, to yeah. go back and relearn network things myself. But you know, I think if we if we accept that that this is how cloud governance needs to change, but we also need to have our on-premise, and we're not going to blow apart our org structures then we can start having the negotiation to figure out what's going to be the best it, option for us. Is it the same team or separate teams with different roles and responsibilities when you start separating some of your cloud architecture from your on-premise architecture? Like how those teams I feel like should work very closely together. Yes. And the answer is yes, because what I found working with lots of orgs, it, it just kind of depends a, a little bit. Uh, in some cases, so here's my thoughts. I almost don't care too much about the org structure itself. Mm -hmm. The breakdown in teams, as long as you have the right subject matter experts in the right places, right. and you have policy differences. And by policies, I don't mean like the high level policies of thou shall, you know, have a secure network. Like the more the detail, let's say the control objectives. That's the level mm -hmm. that I tend to operate in when we're dealing with this stuff. So there's cloud security control objectives that are different from on-prem control objectives. Correct. And there will be overlap between them. But what I don't like is like, let's take NIST 853 and use it for our cloud model. Well, it's not cloud specific. It has some cloud language in there, but you have mm -hmm. piles of other stuff. So let's have a hierarchy of here's our overall stuff. Like that's where your HR, your BYOD policies and everything else come in. And they can branch out in cloud. These are our cloud specific control objectives. And they'll still meet our other higher policy requirements. And in on da the data center, we've got our data center stuff. And, and by the way, this is the stuff that weirdly I, for a very long time, hated talking about and moved away from. Uh, back Going back to Gartner days, I had the choice of being the GRC guy. And I took a step back. And I'm like, no, I'm technical, man. Mm. I don't want to be like talking about policies and governance. Right. But I'm I think it's an important starting point because I think what you described is really great in allowing people to think about how policies affect the various parts of your IT organization and your development organization. Because then, like you said, it doesn't matter what the roles are. You may have one developer in your model, they can operate within policies and work with the security team. You may have a really large organization that has cloud security, security engineers, cloud security architects, software architects, developers, but they can all basically work and live underneath those policies that should allow them not to really screw things up when it comes to security. Yeah, exactly. And there should be flexibility. So uh, you know, I've been playing a lot with like different work models and, um, and I don't think there's one answer. I mean, there really right. isn't. Uh, typically what really helps when you're earlier in your journey is to build a cloud center of excellence. That's mm -hmm. the, I don't know why we came up with that name. I didn't come up with it, somebody else did. But basically like the cloud team, which early is going to be people from other parts of the org and you need at least one executive sponsor on it. I yeah. mean, somebody's got to be able to, like I've seen these stood up and they have no authority, so nothing nothing happens. Right, because um, I think you got to allow the teams to make the right decisions and that's going to be really hyper dependent on the, the application that you're developing yeah. and its requirements. So like, you know, some of my first questions are, I think whether you're developing a new application or moving an existing application, what what's your path into cloud? Is it is it EC2? Is it containers? Is it all the different types of containers? Is it Lambda? Is it cloud native? And then how do you you know bridge all those all those together? And so I guess the the better question because those are probably six different webinars <laughs> in uh, <laughs> in and of themselves. Like how do you structure your organization and policies and process to, to land on the right decision all yeah. the time. 
Yeah, it's it's going to be a variation, and especially because things get ugly. Like multi-cloud is one of the stupidest decisions you could ever make, but it's also forced on you a lot because you do like yeah. merger and acquisition. So all of a sudden you've got to be with Azure even though you've been Amazon, or you got to deal with Google even though you've been Azure. Uh, so I think that the the idea of the center of excellence it's the knights of the round table. You, you get like a council together mm -hmm. to you know it's a steering committee in a lot of ways with representatives from the major teams. But over time, you can start spinning some of that out into here's our core policies, procedures, our templates, our frameworks, here's our infrastructure as code. Or, like, there are ways to take that concept and become more definitive while still allowing flexibility. So yeah, because I, like, I like everyone to hash that out beforehand. So when I come with an application, you've got a path where, where I... I believe we've made mistakes here in our application and many others is the developers tend to define everything like, oh, I want to build it this way. And then they go off and build it this way. And then you run into security issues and you run into scalability issues, you run into integration issues because they've just chosen the wrong path, likely because like, oh, I want to use what's new and shiny and hot. And, you know, I want to use the React with Amplify and I want to use incognito because and I want to use this storage mechanism and those may not be the right pieces you know this is um the the recommendation that I tend to make and and having lived this myself like building a whole platform you know a cloud security platform it's a couple of things one is give developers uh, sandbox accounts, or I, I, I don't mm -hmm. know why I call my own my playground account, whatever. Yeah. Well, I'll screw around with every one of these technologies. I agree. Don't yes. give them access to production data. Mm -hmm. Let them figure it out. Then what we need to do is the council and everything, we come up with uh, standards, and then we take those, and uh, there's a baseline controls that need to be in place for sure. Mm -hmm. Those baseline controls. Particularly, you start off by developing those for the major services like S3 and EC2 and ECS and EKS and whatever mm -hmm. land whatever you're going to use. Um, and then you have those baseline controls that you start with, uh, and you codify that and you build that into policies. But at the same time, you offer flexibility of when you want to go outside the boundaries of what's approved. There's there's two aspects of that. One is get security architects, make them available to these teams early. And yes. security architect is not some security person who's just going to say no because they don't understand the technology. It has to be somebody that understands the technology. And their job is to get to yes. That, that's got to right. be, like, right. how do we get to yes? Like, we're, maybe I've been hanging out with sales teams and stuff, but how do you get to yes? Mm -hmm. But that's the job of that, that person is to guide them in the right direction, to try to enable it. And if it is a new service or something, you know, they, the re Amplify React that they want to play with, then it's their the security architect's job to figure out what's going to be the right way to use that. Mm -hmm. And all of this also, by the way, data classification compliance has to come into play for, for larger orgs because you do need to like get to make sure the service can meet your compliance requirements. That's something often out of your hands. It's down to the cloud provider. And you've got to make sure that uh, you know that you know some things are going to be riskier. Or maybe like you have customer private data. And because of that, Amazon's AI ML program will actually, if you use it, will move that data in other regions that you lose control over. Okay, well, no, we're not going to do that. Like, those, mm -hmm. our tech needs to say no to some of that, but steer in the right direction. So my philosophy around this is, and, and this is the, you know, the direct advice I've done on a lot of projects, build out those controls, build out the policies, the control objectives being the key one, and then the controls. Uh, start building out a library of templates for common design patterns. Like once you have a team that does something and it's approved, like get that infrastructure as code and make it available to other teams or a version of it. Mm -hmm. That's an example. And then have an exception policy so that every time those new, because cloud moves too fast, you can't just not let people use those services. So that's why the get to yes is so important. It's let's figure out the right way to use the service, do an assessment, and it can't take months. Okay. Some of these, it only takes days to look mm -hmm. at some of these. From a security perspective, that's not deep implications to every little individual option. Uh, and then, and then wrap that up in this service is approved in this region for these categories of data, 
and the data categories are typically like, you know, no more than like three, um, you know, because PII and financial data are, are different than maybe healthcare data and you don't get too hung up on much of the rest. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious for how you advise companies because, you know, we've run into this is when you adopt new cloud technologies, how do you measure how long that implementation is going to take and balance that with security and functionality? In other words, let's say you've got a team that's really good at building containers, but you're like, hey, this cloud native stuff is really cool. We can save potentially time and effort by using Amazon services versus building containers ourselves. But the ramp up, how do you measure that ramp up time? Because now you take, you, you got to build skills, right? Yeah, it, sometimes it's the flip of a switch. We deal with this all the time. So our our platform, uh, I, I gave a talk at our in, internal tech summit recently, like the the four versions of it. I mean, we have rebuilt this thing, mm -hmm. re-architected it really deeply, probably four times. And we've finally gotten to the point now where we're able to do smaller iterations uh, mm -hmm. in terms of services come out. But let me give you a, a very specific example. So when we first started collecting telemetry for CloudWatch events from customers or EventBridge events, because they changed the name since we've done it, mm -hmm. uh, the mechanism we had to use was there wasn't a good way to centrally collect those. Uh, so we ended up deploying Lambda functions in the customer environments with secrets and secrets manager. And, mm -hmm. and that Lambda function would hit an API endpoint that we had. So we're literally taking these native events, sending them over the internet, to an API endpoint is JSON and then ingesting them over there. Uh, and it, it was relatively speedy, but I mean, come on, that is not necessarily efficient, but that was the option. Mm -hmm. Amazon last year or so added event bridge support, which allowed us to directly move data from a customer's event bridge onto our event bridge. Customers controlled it all in their hands in security. Uh, and then that allowed us to just take out all these middlemen faster, more efficient, more cost-effective, less to deploy in a customer environment, yada, yada, yada. And we're not the only ones using this, all right? I'm using myself as an example, uh, trying not to be overly promotional despite the t-shirt, but it is what it is. So, but that's the mechanism that we switched to. And so, okay, well, we had to look at it. What are the security implications? How do we need to configure this? How do we, do we need to worry, for example, uh, about the, uh, uh, non-repudiation of the events coming into our account from a customer account, like could they could they fluff those, make a change to those? Now in this case, it was a really short conversation because it was inherently more secure than what we were doing. Mm -hmm. So I mean, send stuff over to APIs, and we had to have API keys, and we had to have, do it in Secrets Manager and Customer Environment. Like in this case, we got better security, lower cost, greater efficiency, without. Yeah. But that evaluation had to occur. But Maybe I love those time. those three items, I think, is what people should focus on, right? Performance, yeah. security, and scalability was the other one? Uh, the ones I use, uh, which are a little different than how I worded it, it's agility, resiliency, economics, and security are like mm -hmm. the four key benefits of cloud if you do things. And that's how I measure everything. Is it going to be cheaper, or more expensive? Is it going to be more or less resilient? Like in this case, it was... The resiliency was a concern because it's not public, but event bridge can miss events sometimes. Right. And so what's our backup as a security focused company? Like we had to worry about uh, when, you know, are, are we gonna flood this and, and hit too many events and lose security events for customers that are important? Like this is, we had to figure out what our, our risk tolerance levels were, for example. So the resiliency was a concern there, but it was no worse than what we were doing is the end mm -hmm. result. Because the source feed, of event breach had those same issues as in terms of how we we're getting those events. Uh, then there's security, and like in this case, it was better, and uh, resiliency, less stuff to mess around with. We're not yeah, yeah, yeah. relying on less services, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. And then the resiliency more became for us on the back end, making sure we can ingest it. That's one example, and there's like tons of examples. So, one of the very first, let me, you know what? Let me see if I can do my wife, my live whiteboarding. I was threatening to sure. do here. Uh, so let me share my Why screen. Why you do that? Why you do that, Rich? Do you have experience with Google's Cloud? There's a question in the chat. Um, uh, you know, this person feels like we don't hear much about it these days. I do know a few people that are using exclusively GCP and or leveraging some services 
in there in a multi-cloud environment, which I know you're not a fan of, but is that a viable option that we, we should be looking at? Yeah, um, I don't do a lot in Google yet. I'm, I know I need to do more. I've got a good friend who does a lot more with it, and I, I've been trusting his advice. It can be messy because mm -hmm. uh, Google is they, – they, they're still struggling to figure out how to work with enterprises, to be completely mm -hmm. honest. Uh, and they, they've run into some security gaps and stuff there. But um, certainly, yeah, I mean, I would, you know, for the right projects, uh, Google can make sense. You know, I, I hit the point where I, I know I can't get to the level of depth on Google as I am on Amazon at a technical level. So I do tend to stick with what I know. And, and Amazon's a more mature platform, but I, I mm -hmm. Google is perfectly serviceable. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. By the way, are you, am I sharing a big blank white screen? You are. Okay. Yeah. And so uh, going back, and if you have a, a more detailed question about Google, let me know um, other than the generic one there. So uh, going to the live whiteboard uh, uh, I've got here, this is pretty cool. So this is one of the first, this is probably the first time I was on client engagement and they brought me in to do a security assessment. I ended up re-architecting and giving them the, talking about the benefits that we talked about. And so the client was a, uh, it was a financial institution and they had their data center. And what they wanted to set up was uh, the data center was gonna send traffic. So now we're into the AWS side over SFTP. Uh, and then this was an instance. So it was uh, a single instance, extra large, they didn't even have it behind a load balancer. Uh, and this was for big data analytics. So this was going to be batch jobs mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, of, uh, of parables or whatever they were, data, they were sending. Right, right. Uh, and so then that would go to uh, an analytics layer. And I think it was, it was again, in, in instances. And then that was going to store some, the results in S3. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were going to, and they were being smart about this. They were going to actually, KMS had just come out. So they're going to use a KMS what's, key. What's, K, what's uh, key KMS? Sorry. Key management service. Okay. Amazon's key management service. So they were going to, uh, you know, go ahead and encrypt the data here because you could actually use it. You could get the key with an API call. So mm -hmm. it would call out to KMS, get the key back, encrypt the data, uh, and then it could be decrypted here at that analytics layer. And I can't remember mm -hmm. if it was here or here. And so I went in, I said, hey, guys, okay, this is this looks fine. You're being smart about this. Your security group rules are, you know, so the security group was tied down to just their IP address. Uh, everything was looking pretty solid there. But I said, hey, what if this goes down? Like, this is an extra large instance. Mm -hmm. It's the only ingest. You're using SFTP, like, the you know, kind of an old school thing. And does this break the rest? And they said, yeah. I mean, that, that was the architecture. So, and, and again, they were trying to use cloud native stuff here. So mm -hmm. instead I said, and I don't remember exactly why, where I, I sort of came up with this, but so let's, you know, we have our data center here. Um, and then why don't we just have an S3 bucket here? And in S3, S3 supports this, right? You can directly, yeah. you can put a, is it a client? Is it inscriptable and in that whole thing on the, any platform? The API calls or the more, it, it turns out the most efficient thing is just install the command line tools because that handles yeah. uh, like multi-part threading and everything for you. I so gotcha. let's go ahead, let's take it up into S3. And the cool thing is about S3 is they applied a policy that would only accept it from the IP address of the data center. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in, uh, I'm sorry, Rich, that, that connection, uh, someone's also asking, uh, Azure Key Vault is similar to KMS, and I'm assuming yes. GCP has yep. similar services, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think it's KMS and GCP. They use a lot of the same names as Amazon, so yeah, that okay. part makes life a little bit easier. So yeah, every one of the services has these. Now, they all work differently, uh, mm -hmm. Key Vault works versus KMS is different, but you can do exactly what I am just I'm diagramming this out on Amazon. But this is one where everything I'm going to show you, every one of these features exists on Google and exists on Azure. I guess so the, yeah. the S3 uh, client, if you will, for lack of a better term, uh, in the data center, it contains keys 
that allow it to encrypt the uh, nope. transfer to S3? Nope, don't even need to worry about it. So in this case, uh, you could do it that way if you wanted, but remember, this is gonna be an encrypted connection as long as you set set it up right. There's config settings for S3 that it will only accept encrypted data. Mm -hmm. And you could encrypt the data here before you send it. You would make an API call to KMS, mm -hmm. get the key back and encrypt it. Or you just tell S3, encrypt everything in this bucket with this key. And that's the way we typically will do it. Because you already have link encryption. Mm -hmm. And then S3 by default will encrypt it using what's known as a customer managed key. Oh, okay. Yeah. And it's super easy to set up. I can show you how to do it in a few clicks. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can even enforce that with automation and stuff. All right. So goes into S3. Now, this is where stuff gets interesting. Part of S3 is, um, I'm trying to figure out the best way to actually sketch this out. Uh, let me do it this way. So um, let's go ahead and So when you put something in there, this will actually, can. Uh, it's an event. So that is an, any time an object goes, so let me go to, I don't know, I'll use purple for the object. So mm -hmm. this object here goes along this pipe to here, and then that triggers a CloudWatch event. Right. When that CloudWatch event triggers, it launches, a Lambda function. So that event runs the Lambda function. This is where things get fancy. I mean, that's really cool. So, I mean, basically when a file transfer completes, you execute code. Yeah. Back here is a fully private VPC. I don't know, make it a slash 16. Doesn't need to be. So I'm like drawing on a upright screen here. Here, let me just yeah, no put this in my lap. It'll be easier. All right. So within here, normally we have nothing running. But when an event comes in, we can trigger one or more. Because remember, Lambda functions will execute in parallel. Every event will trigger a new Lambda function. These are analytics instances, as big or as small as you want them to be. Mm -hmm. It'll launch as many as you need at that point in time, or there's none of them running when you don't need it. This uses a hook. I'm being very inconsistent with my colors here, but that's all right. Mm -hmm. Known as a service endpoint. A service endpoint is basically like a private route internal to Amazon that will only give access to that S3 bucket. And part of this, uh, what probably needs to span out on here, uh, if you get into the nitty gritty details, and there's a couple of different ways of doing this. I'm just gonna show one, but we're gonna have a message queue, simple queue service, mm -hmm. which is gonna hold the job. So it, what really you would probably do is actually have SQS trigger a different Lambda function this is probably how I would architect it for real. So that uh, the first, yeah, let me do this. I'm gonna be accurate. I'm getting really into the, you tell me, Paul, if I'm going too far on this, but this is what no, I would no. really make it look like. So the first Lambda's function's job is just to take that event and dump it to SQS. Uh, I can't remember, you might be able to just take the, th this would be input sanitization if you needed it. You could yep. potentially go directly to SQS and just kind of skip the Lambda function. This Lambda function, launches the jobs and then this instance pulls its data from the queue uh not quite right anyway doesn't matter there's nuances here i'm, I'm not doing correctly uh and then when it's done it deletes out of the queue but if it doesn't delete out of the queue like if something breaks mm -hmm. it'll launch you know, another one will pick up the job and then you have dead letter queues if that one messages so there's all this advanced stuff and then the end result is you have another S3 bucket over here that has the results and the data center can read from there. 
So let's think of the implications of this. So you've done pen testing. What's your attack surface? What are you going after? Uh, first is the computer in the data center. Yeah, every time. Or the admin's laptop because they have yeah. their admin keys on it. Yep, every single time I'm going after there. All right, what's your next option? This is the low-hanging fruit. Uh, misconfiguration of S3. Yeah, but that's tough. I mean, because you're only yeah, talking. Someone's got to make a someone's got to make a mistake in configuration for me to gain access to S3, right? Yep. How do you get to these? Yeah, you've got to somehow get inside the VPC or inside the message queue or the Lambda functions, right? Uh, yeah, logic. You can go. You can yeah. do logic attacks, but there's this has no internet gateway or NAT gateway. It has no inter zero internet access. All and those are so every time does the lambda function execute inside that instance or the lambda function spawns the instance yeah so the the lambda functions will say there's a job run the instance mm -hmm. and then pass the data in pass like the job id mm -hmm. into the instance so it knows what file to pull I so like that. what i would the data that i would transfer over that lambda function when it runs the instance there's something known as the user data field mm -hmm. And by the way, you can do this as containers. This is not a good example for containers when you talk about why I would yeah, use sure. not containers. But in the user data field, um, I would put in the uh, basically the, uh, the S3 object. It's going to be a URL. And so it'll pull just that specific object that it's supposed to do its job on. Mm -hmm. And the instance is what's operating on the data, not the Lambda function? Correct. The Lambda okay. function's job is the coordinator. It's, yep. it's just okay. to launch the instance because this is big data analytics. You can't mm -hmm. do stuff in Lambda functions, but Lambda functions really are best if they only need to run for you know less than a minute at a time. So it's cost starts going you. up. I got you. Yeah, it's not that before. That's very similar to what I would like to build for something like <laughs> processing video, right? Oh, this is a standard, relatively consistent design for video processing that's done all the time. People yeah. pipeline their video into this stuff, yeah. Yeah, and, and also sending it off to a third, so like, you know, we use uh, an application with an API to send a video to YouTube, and, you know, I've seen similar designs where you use Lambda, right? So user uploads a video, says pushes a button in the web app that says, upload this to YouTube. Um, the Lambda would do the API communications with YouTube, use your messaging queuing service so you could queue those up in very similar to what you drew drew out, actually. Uh, I think I did this for DEF CON. Um, we, we had to switch to all online during COVID. We had to do, because I'm on the speaker team, uh, I, built a, an, I built an app that would basically do conversions, pull stuff out of different sources, URLs, convert it, and then dump it in S3. Mm -hmm. I think I actually did the video processing part on my system mm -hmm. uh, because I could, and you know, it, it was fine. I had a big, I had a powerful enough computer. I'm trying to remember, or did I run that in an instance? I can't. It, this is this is the deal, man. With cloud, I don't even remember like where yeah. I ran it. I have to go pull my code. Yeah, um, today we use f of mpeg inside of a container to do the conversion, but you know, Amazon's media services are really robust, right? Those oh, are. Yeah. Isn't that what Netflix uses for their media processing? Is that is that true? I don't know, actually. I've got, I know people who work there, but I've never asked that question. So, yeah, I don't know if they use that or if they use their own. So what's so, the, yeah, in applications, like what's the correct um, application of containers in your mind? Obviously what you just drew out didn't yeah. use containers at all. And I, I think people use containers in all kinds of different ways sometimes it's, it's probably not correct like they could get away with something else most of the time it's not correct mm -hmm. uh, a large percentage of, of use of containers right now is incorrect either because the people using them don't necessarily either know the benefits or care about the benefits like they might be more interested in uh like they want to learn the technology for themselves which is fine uh, mm -hmm. or uh, they were forced into it because of other, like it's the only way to get stuff, like to circumvent IT. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, we are. use them, 
probably not in the in the truest sense of their application, but we use it so we can push an application. So they're ephemeral for the dev process. So we can yeah. spin up an environment, run test against it. If that passes, push it up into the cloud, destroy the instances and push and push a new release. But I, I think in a lot of use cases, what, what you've told me before is you can probably use EC2 uh, for, for some of that stuff as well. Yeah, the way I think about containers is there's two primary advantages to containers. Uh, one is ephemerality and the other is portability. Mm -hmm. So what containers are really good for is uh, similar to this ar architecture. This was an event-driven architecture. Right. Top gets loaded, event kicks off, do the analysis shutdown. Containers, mm -hmm. from that standpoint, are a good answer for that. But I'll tell you why, mm -hmm. in this case, I wouldn't think they were the right answer. Uh, so they're like single function. I'm up, you see me, I go away. So it's a, it's more of a, um, and that gets into some, not scalability in terms of total scalability, but like we use them for, we have an inventory system that has to connect to customers' accounts, pull data in, mm -hmm. do a little bit of processing, dump it into a database. That, it's not good for serverless because serverless, they would, it needs to run too long, the, the okay. volume of code we have. And, uh, for it's not good for instances because the other part of containers is for performance. Mm -hmm. and containers don't improve performance and scalability per se. That's a misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. So an instance would give us better performance. We don't need the performance. We just need to go out, make a bunch of API calls, drop down. Mm -hmm. um, and what I mean by that is containers don't scale to improve performance necessarily because they are constrained by the cluster hooks that's the compute that's the right. chips that's the memory is on the host within the cluster mm -hmm. so for something for some tasks like what you describe uh like what we do for this curious website is we auto scale the instances because if i need more performance i don't want to be paying for unused cpu cycles just so i can run containers on a cluster host right it just makes more sense to me to scale out instances for that yeah. use case and those are long running, long running things tend to mm -hmm. work better in instances. Uh, containers can give you portability. And I, I have an example I'll give you of, of some of where I use them for portability uh, and also for that agility for I'm up, see me, I'm down. Because then you don't, you don't deal with memory leaks. It mm -hmm. does its job, it goes away. Uh, so a bad example of containers is when people build lamp stacks on their containers for websites. Like, why would you do that? Mm -hmm. Now, if you needed to run that for real in like DigitalOcean and Amazon and Azure for whatever reason, or maybe you're distributing uh, a piece of software and you want to let the customer run it wherever they want to come run it, right, it's right. Just, they're good for that. Uh, in my case, the where I use it for two different things I'm using containers for right now with uh, when we do uh, incident response labs. One is the attack instances, the things that are the attack containers, the code mm -hmm. that simulates attacks. Uh, we actually send, we have a, a platform, uh, Will Bankson, who's at Net, um, he's at Hashtag Corp now, he used to be over at Netflix and Cap One. Uh, Will and I built this together. So he built a cool dashboard where we list all the accounts, 281 accounts in our training environment. And we can click on all of them or just some of them and launch different attacks to different accounts. That goes into a message queue. Then on the other side, we have containers that we distribute all over the place. Some are on my laptop, some are in DigitalOcean, some are in Amazon, mm -hmm. some are in Azure. So we can launch them from anywhere so we can simulate attacks coming in from different IP addresses. Right. Portability mattered there because those run no matter where we put them. So we mm -hmm. build the container once and we do legitimately run it in all of these different locations. And then they run their attacks and they shut down. So they get that ephemeral nature of it. Now those are mostly class will leave like the same containers up and running we don't need to shut them down i mean they crash a lot because i wrote some of the code and of course it's gonna crash <laughs> probably, you know. it happens the other piece of it is i have uh code for cleaning and for uh, provisioning and cleaning the accounts provisioning is not bad cleaning is ugly because we have put so much into these training accounts in that case, I'm using containers because it's longer running tasks, sometimes for hours. Mm -hmm. I don't need great performance out of them, 
but I need to run in parallel. So I need to run 180 of these things simultaneously to wipe a class in two hours or overnight at the worst, so I can have it ready for the next students in the morning. So that's taking advantage of the containers, the nature of running them in parallel, and each one's running the same function and they're pulling from a message queue and they're all hitting different targets. Mm -hmm. The attack, similar model. Our internal inventory service, same thing, we can scale out as many as we need to hit all the individual targets, but the bulk performance, I'm not looking for scalability, but I'll add a cluster when I need to add a cluster. You know, I'll right. put another host on there, not a cluster, but a new, a new host into the cluster. Like that's our performance scalability, but it's performance in that it is, uh, I'm only running the task I need at that point in time and I can run hundreds of them or I can run just a few of them mm -hmm. at any given point in time. And running instances doesn't make sense in that case because I don't need the power of even a micro instance. Like right, these things right. Yeah, sure. So that's kind of philosophical thoughts. Now the problem we run into is that containers are dramatically overused today, and especially with Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. Because to run containers, you need a container management system, an orchestration layer to run containers. And we're building out all these microservices and everything else. Uh, but I think what we're running into is like Kubernetes is really, really complex. It is a wonderful tool for Google, and it's almost always the worst tool for everybody else. Mm -hmm. Like it does add a lot of a, a lot of power and flexibility. Do you need it for how you're using your containers and your services? And the answer is sometimes yes. I'm not anti-containers. I use them myself. But right. I think we don't have questions. And then it, it's going back to security, what we're here for. Like doing container security well is is really hard on multiple levels. Yeah. And Kubernetes really increases the complexity. Now you can mediate yeah. some of that by using Google's, you know, Kubernetes engine or Azure or AKS or EKS. Mm -hmm. Like that reduces your some of your overhead in terms of the complexity of running Kubernetes. But there's still a lot, a lot there. So many layers of abstraction, so many interacting tools. You get your service mesh and your is your Istio. And and you've got Helm charts, and you've got all of this stuff, which is you've now taken a cloud and put it on your cloud. I mean, you never understood the yeah. first cloud, and now you've got this other cloud layering on top of it. Right. It's fine if you're gonna do it, but you gotta staff it. You gotta have the resources to do it. Anyway, um, that's well, my what about the, the use case for containers, Rich, where you know the developer can have a containerized environment, do development locally, that gets pushed up through Git. The environments can then be built uh, for security testing, for QA, um, and then you're pushing those same containers uh, and container builds out to production so that everyone's on the same platform so you can introduce a change in development, push it up, get it tested, and push it to production. That's where I see some use, that's how we're using containers today. Yeah. So that like when I do a local development build, it updates all my libraries. And it tries to build it locally, and guess what? It breaks, and then I have to fix some code, and then I fix it, and I push that change that change out. That's legit. Um, I do think, though, at a certain point, particularly for large-scale enterprise scalable applications, mm -hmm. sometimes it makes more sense to use those containers locally. Also, when you're doing that, you're not taking advantage of cloud-native capabilities. This is a big change Correct. that we have. Correct. This, and, you know, and again, we use containers, we use servers, we use a bunch of other stuff. Uh, and we moved to a CDK based approach for Amazon. So the cloud development kit um, mm -hmm. for our deployment process, which does allow us to have these dev test environments done via infrastructure as code. So you actually mm -hmm. build the environment and all the dependencies and everything. And for a developer, it's just a smaller environment and for production, it's a, it's a more scaled environment. So you can do everything you talked about because you're getting the cloud. CDK or yep. Terraform or something like that, as opposed to gotcha. putting it in your Docker files. Right, right. What's yeah. the secure? Are there security benefits of of either, or is it really just six of one, half dozen the other? Yeah, you know, I mean, we're so deep into like it's just how good you are. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, you can lock down a a, a Kube's environment if you know what you're doing. You can get your observability. You got to buy the right tooling and everything else. But the same is true for cloud. So mm -hmm. uh, the to the greatest degree possible, I always try to leverage. I think you gain uh, advantages by using an equivalent cloud service. So like uh, I was on a project, uh, I just sent the invoice over yesterday and they had uh, 
they hadn't deployed this piece of it yet, but they're looking at using RabbitMQ and running that in a container. Mm -hmm. And so I told them the nightmare story of one of our no longer with us developers years ago running RabbitMQ in a container, and it really cre created massive problems for our scalability. Yeah, uh, he did it without talking to anybody. It's early startup days; nobody was looking over his shoulder because he's a smart guy that knew what he was doing. But this was a bad decision. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm like, why don't you just use Amazon's SQS? And they go, well, we don't want to be locked down to the cloud provider. I'm like, why? Yeah, he, I, I, why? I think. I think more often than not, we need to arm security folks with the the right way to steer in that direction. Uh, to go, if you're locked into a cloud provider, it it's okay today. Is that is that a, a when is that a valid argument? I guess is the question. It's fine. I mean, it it is what it is. You know, you're not going to get those four benefits if you're not taking advantage of the inherent capabilities that provider gives you, and they're not going to be the same as the next provider. So if you don't want it, and you're gonna end up being locked into the provider anyway, because like maybe your application is a generic container app that can run anywhere, you'll be less locked in, all your logging, monitoring, and alerting, your compliance, your like all your wraparound infrastructure, all your wraparound management right. is always gonna be specific for that cloud provider. So it, it's kind of a myth that you're not gonna, and then migrating that to the next one, you can do it, but, but you gotta do it. It's not like that's effortless. So right. I, what, I think, what about the I, but what about the resiliency? What about the resiliency argument? If I'm building really large enterprise application, I just don't want to be locked into Amazon because Amazon goes down. Is that just poor architecture within Amazon's cloud? Um, you can so for resiliency, uh, basically there's a there's three layers. This goes back to the stuff we teach in the basic cloud security training class. Mm -hmm. um, layer one is resiliency within a given account, a given subscription, a given Google project. So, uh, and it's resiliency within a region. So that's using uh, availability zones and auto scale mm -hmm. groups and that kind of stuff. Like, let's be resilient, like in, I'm gonna again, I'm gonna stick with Amazon terminology, but I mean, you can do this again on all of them. Uh, all right, I'm gonna build this to be resilient within US West 2. Uh, that's what we did. Uh, you know, we're our primary operating environment is US West 2. Then there's resiliency uh, for individual services within that region. And sometimes you're just going to accept some level of outage because mm -hmm. Amazon, the odds, like their uptime numbers are great. Now, again, mm -hmm. Google and Azure have different uptimes and downtimes. So mm -hmm. you have to look at your provider and understand where those edges are. Then you get resiliency into cross region. So that would be right. like we have a version in running in Asia and then we are staying, is it, we have another version in another region. I can't remember which region it is because I'm not on that operational side anymore. Right. But so that's cross region resiliency. And we accept a little bit of downtime to switch over to regions potentially. Yeah. Uh, that, okay. That's, you know, something that, that happens. Uh, and there's edges. Uh, the uh, the phrase I like to use is the cloud is filled with invisible razor blades. It's not just sharp edges. Like right. we had an outage of one of our services. So it's kind of a microservice design. So only one service went out. We had architected Lambda functions. And I think these are the ones that needed to connect to the container. So that it's Lambda functions that had to have local network access. They were on a VPC. Mm -hmm. We deployed them in multiple availability zones. And there was a weirdness, like a very detailed nuance in Amazon about how if there was an availability zone outage, uh, when the Lambda functions, you would actually get a new Lambda function attaching to the proper subnet in the other availability zone. So it had it has to do with how Lambda functions are reused and could start, cold start, hot starts, mm -hmm. stuff. It was somewhere in the documentation, but it was pretty deep. So we had thought yeah. we had architected for that. Uh, we detected it and it was, a, it was an easy fix. We did, um, uh, a CDK push, uh, which just flipped that setting to be to properly. And then the other thing is, it's just by doing the push, refresh all the all the lambda functions anyway. And yeah. then so we didn't have any running in the down availability zone. Like oh, so, that's okay. those kind of razor blade sorts of things that we didn't know about ahead of time. I mean, I sound like really smart now, but it's my CTO going, "Oh, hey, guess what happened today?" Yeah, uh, and and explaining you know why we had that minimal outage. We didn't lose any data or anything.
So that's an example of, of that resiliency piece. So multi-cloud is a resiliency. When is the last time all of Amazon has gone down? Mm -hmm. Multi-region. It's usually pockets, right? Pockets. Uh, Azure has had some multi-region outages. Uh, I don't know about Google. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, they're hopefully getting better at it. I haven't seen one. I, I'm trying to remember when the last one was. But it's pockets, and it's know your provider, know the resiliency, know the downtime, you know, making sure you're running in another one. And let's be honest, these are all probably better than running in your data center. Like some people listening today are likely mature enough that they are that good in their data center. I'm not saying nobody is, but most of you are, and I'm not. I've never been that good to have that level of uptime. So. Disaster recovery, man. Know your RTOs and your RPOs, and sometimes there's a little downtime. Yeah, you're never going to achieve 100% uptime, as as we all know. But I also feel like there's a there's a tolerance level that I've seen some SaaS services better than others. And well, you know, well, I don't SaaS, want to name names, but like oh, I've man. seen some that are like, I'm like that. You no, that's too much downtime for me to rely on that for my business. Whereas other ones, yes, okay, they have downtime, but I'm like, okay, I can deal with the level of downtime they have, right? Yeah, exactly. You just gotta know, and SaaS is a whole different ballgame. SaaS, like most of what I've said today, it doesn't apply to SaaS, because SaaS is still a lot of the Wild West, and you never know what you're gonna get. You know, it's like a- But they're using Amazon in the background, right? So it's their uh, architecture, a lot of them are, right? Yeah, it doesn't mean they're good at it. I mean, I'm a SaaS platform. We have downtime to do this stuff on our end. You know, yeah. that has nothing to do with Amazon. Um, well, along those lines, before I get to an audience question, if the audience has more questions, by all means, uh, please put them uh, either in GoToWebinar or in Discord. Um, and we do have a giveaway question uh, as well. So I don't want to forget about that either. Um, but when you enable the elasticity, right, or the resilience to spin up new architecture automatically in the cloud there are some security concerns with that there have been instances in pockets where amazon is on your behalf spinning up new stuff for you and that new stuff has security controls missing that your original instances uh, don't have or have right have you seen that kind of stuff not uh, too much because Some of the researchers at Black Hills had pointed this out in, in specific cloud native services that when uh, it, it was time to spin up new stuff to accommodate a larger workload, that new stuff was spun up with default passwords with other security controls missing. That's not Amazon, that's you, um, because all of that is defined in your configurations. So if it's instances or containers, uh, it's uh, it will only spin up what you have defined as you want spun up. Like that is, you know, I, I, now the thing is, is if you accidentally like launch an older version or something, right. uh, you know, that, that certainly is where, and this is why everything should run through pipelines because if you patch in prod, there's no patching in prod in cloud when it comes to a running workload. Like you can definitely run into issues there, uh, accidentally spin up old versions, but that's going to be on you because you know, like in an auto scale group or in a container environment, it just pulls the image it's told to pull. Right. And if that has the, the default stuff in. Now, uh, there, there are have the bugs. I, I guess, server. sorry, Rich, my example was a bug. Amazon did have a bug where it was doing that in one particular service at one given time, right? But that was a one off bug and they, and they fixed it. The, oh, the larger okay. concern is what, what you're addressing is in your own configurations, make sure that stuff spins up the way you want it to spin up when it's time to auto scale. Yeah, and that's the cloud security, or that's the uh, shared responsibilities model piece. Like that's a big deal mm -hmm. when Amazon makes those screw ups or Microsoft, and we've been seeing more of those lately because sure. researchers have finally gotten smart enough to figure out the cracks. Yeah, uh, in Azure, Azure's had some real issues. Dude, I have a real problem with Azure. Yeah, like spinning up containers in Azure has had some horrific uh, containerization breakouts and, and issues. Um, I have been calling on, you know, on Twitter. So clearly that's going to change the world. Uh, <laughs> it's yeah. I, Microsoft needs a trusted cloud initiative. I mean, they need to go back. Yeah. They are moving really fast. They want to compete so much with Amazon security is not a priority and it kills me because to this day, they have exceptionally good security professionals on their team 
and they're the one knocking down these international botnets, but Correct. yet they can't build Azure securely because they're not engaged at the right places. Mm. And there's a lot of low hanging fruit that keeps coming up on Azure. It's not low hanging fruit. Some of these are pretty well nuanced, but I don't currently have confidence in Azure uh, to the same degree. Now, Amazon also has had some issues and stuff, but sure. it's been much more kind of responsive about these things. Agreed. Uh, there was a question from the audience on, um, does it break compliance requirements to enable an S3 bucket for public uh, access? Uh, maybe. It depends on what data is in there. So like our mm -hmm. entire front end app is in an S3 bucket. It's a React app. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and you know, like you brought up, it's Amplify, stored in an S3 bucket on a CloudFront distribution. Yeah. Uh, and then that, that's totally fine because that's meant to be public. But, Correct. Yeah, our videos, we use similar technology, Rich, for our videos. I'm like, the data you're storing in S3 is public. Like, it's intended to be public. Once it hits our S3 bucket, it doesn't matter. It's, it's going to be distributed out to the world for everyone to see. And you have to, like, really jump through hoops to make something public in S3 as well. <laughs> like, they, Amazon makes you click and configure your way to make it to make it public. But I think your point is is obviously valid, right? If it's public data then it's public data. It depends on what type of data you're putting in the S3 bucket as to whether you're compliant or not. So the, the way I write this in as a cloud security control objective is, uh, you know, all public Amazon S3 buckets must be approved by security and register. You know, that that's how I literally write that into a control objective standard. Uh, and then I would say, you know, by default block public access is enabled on all accounts uh, unless that account is designated and approved to have public buckets. But you also need third-party tools to classify the data that's going in. In other words, if I want a policy that says, look, this S3 bucket is public, I'm putting videos in there. Yeah. If someone puts another type of content in there, then I want to know about that immediately. Does There's nothing native in the cloud that would tell you that. Like you need third-party. Some of that, but it's expensive as, uh, it's just the, not use curse words or it's okay to use curse words. Ah, I don't Show. care if it cares. Okay. <laughs> curse words are yeah, as fuck. So, <laughs> such a versatile word. Um, yeah, Macy would be doable for that. There's not a lot of great third party tools on the data security side because it's kind of a, the, the reason is, is it's, it's a data volume problem. Correct. Like, the biggest problem I have recycling Amazon accounts is deleting S3 buckets because I have to delete every object in the buckets and the log mm -hmm. files create many, many, many thousands of objects and there's not one command to delete them all. You gotta delete them one by one. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a nightmare. And by the way, I've, I'm not the only one that wishes Amazon had a, a faster clicky clicky. But of course, mm -hmm. Amazon doesn't want to do that because they don't want the support calls. It's Correct. easier to support calls for, I can't delete fast enough to, uh, I deleted all my seven years of my enterprise logs. Uh, can you get them back? Mm -hmm. So I get it, I guess. But um, yeah, so the, the tooling there is not great. It's never cheap. Uh, on the other hand, you know, so you have to rely a lot on your your other controls, like who can access it from where and, and those kinds of things uh, on those public buckets. And, you know, if you're using all production environments, ideally you do with infrastructure as code and, You've got checks and balances, uh, you know, and that's core to what we do is security. It's just kind of shifting where we have to manage that stuff. Sweet. I'm looking for any other audience uh, questions that we might have. I don't, uh, I don't see any at the moment. What, um, what, what are some of the Amazon services, newer ones, Rich, that you're excited about or perhaps ones that make you cringe in the security person in you? <laughs> Nothing's too cringy. Uh, they just added new IAM capability. Uh, they improved the ability to uh, use what's known as a global condition key. So within an IAM policy, you can actually lock down now to your organization or to just an account. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's really cool because that actually gives us, it solves like a huge problem with some of the stuff on AWS um, with writing policies to like allow this, but only if they're taking this action, you know, within my organization or within this organizational unit, uh, particularly as we are now, you know, Amazon IAM originally started, it was just in that account. 
and then, well, like you could go across the account, but there's no hierarchical management. Now AWS SSO has hierarchical management, but people mm -hmm. are assuming roles really at that high level there. Uh, and this allows you to say, you with this role can only operate in these organizational, you can only do this action in like the dev organizational unit and you have fewer things you can do in the prod. And that was like really hard for a very long time to do. Um, so that was kind of a new, um, uh, pretty cool thing that, that just popped out recently. Um, oh, I, had, I had another uh, question I wanted to pick your brain about, Rich. Um, I think one of the more serious and pretty major problems with applications today, in an even very generic sense, is the management of secrets. Um, and the, you know, that's a very broad term. This could be, I need to store credentials in my application. I need to store API keys. I need to store certificates. What well, what do we have available? I'll I'll start with just you know Amazon AWS. What do we have available today to manage secrets? Because I believe there are multiple services yeah. that you can use to store secrets. And so, like, what's your uh, you, you know high level overview of advice for choosing the right secrets management? Because it's so important, and a lot of people just don't do it, and they end up on GitHub and they end up leaked. So the the default tends to be, it depends on it, a little bit on what you're doing. Um, some things you can actually just use KMS like for internally within Amazon. Right. Uh, but if we're talking secrets like database passwords and stuff, yep. the two primary options for that are gonna be parameter store. Yeah, now, so parameter store is part of like the sysadmin. Yeah. It was like a sysadmin this, component and parameter store is part of that, correct? Yeah, it's kind of weird but it's really secure and mm -hmm. it's basically free, which yes. is what's great about it. But right. what it doesn't do is it's more simple. It doesn't do rotation uh, and right. some of the other things around it a little, but it, it works wonderfully for a very simple secrets manager. Now, right. they Cause it's that. not really a manager. It's just a place to, it's I think it's named appropriately. It's a place to store a, a secret. Yeah. Right. It's it's not management. Like you say, there's no a secrets vault or secrets management implies I'll have some kind of rotation and be able to actually manage those secrets. And that's what secrets manager is for. Yeah. But you pay more for that, but it, okay. it gives you more features. So like for the really simple stuff, parameter store for more secrets manager uh, on Azure, this is built into key vault. So yep. you're going to okay. use key vault to, to do your secrets there. Uh, or and I, I not sure where they go in Google. Sorry. Uh, and then the other option is always if you're doing a lot of stuff, like if if you're uh, if you have a secret, for example, you need both on-prem and in-cloud or something like that. That's where you might bring in like HashiCorp Vault. Uh, yeah, okay. or Vault has more 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 capabilities than, and that's the one I mostly run into is, is Vault. Uh, there's also um, Phycotic, maybe is that the one I'm thinking of? I think they got didn't uh, they get bought? They got bought, I think, right? Phycotic. I have been following Adrian. Uh, pay closer attention to, but yeah. So uh, those are the those are the, the both the cloud native and some of the third party stuff you can look at. Uh, and but SSL certificates is that a different service for managing? Yeah, they've got certificate manager. Mm -hmm. uh, Azure again. I think mostly it's Key Vault. I haven't managed certs myself in Azure. I've managed some of the other stuff in Azure. I mean, as much as I hate Azure, I do try and use it. Yeah. I, I'm not unfamiliar with it i'm not as good on it as i am on amazon but you know i still use it for a bunch of stuff so yeah but yeah there's uh there's a certificate manager which is built in and that that's for a lot of like you can do your own certificate management that's no big deal some do because they already have robust with hsms and everything else but if you don't want to deal with that you can go in the certificate manager and and KMS will also support async keys if you need to get to that level. But certificate manager is for like, because you can just automate stuff onto your load balancers, mm -hmm. like your Amazon stuff that needs certificates. So that's big, big reason for using that one. Uh, it was Centrify, I believe, acquired. It's like, I believe it, that's the way it went. Oh, they, they're they're okay. together now, which, yeah, now we remember okay. coming up the story. Yeah. Go back. Uh, so what do we have to do to win you over on Azure, Rich? <laughs> You know, so there are some things on Azure that have been getting better since I first started using it. There's some things that Azure does well and better than Amazon, and there's some trade-offs about it. Um, the 
so the things that I like about Azure, uh, I think how Azure um, half of logging is better and half of it is worse. What I mean by that is the Azure Activity Log mm -hmm. is uh, like a lot of it is set up cleaner by default than Amazon for, um, and Amazon's gotten better about this as well. They've matched Azure with like 90 days of auto logs. But like on, on um, Azure, I can just plop in at my tenant level and I can look across multiple subscriptions pretty easily in, in Courtney. And that for a very long time was really hard on Amazon. It's now more competitive, but Azure really got that right from the start. Uh, some of the hierarchical stuff around subscriptions is, is better. Um, and because it's not a, an add-on, Amazon added all that. They had to like glue it on, on top of what they already had. Where mm -hmm. with Azure, that was kind of that was kind of built in. I am torn a lot on Azure AD. Mm. I think it is easier to manage for larger enterprises, but uh, I also think it it there's not a good alternative option if you want to give like developers a lot of them to switch roles to do different tasks at different points in time. Mm -hmm. uh, however, get some of that if you add in Azure PIM, so they do have a service to you know, add that in, but it's a, it's another thing you got to pay for. Azure, um, so yeah, I mean, you can pay more and then you'll, you'll get some of these kinds of, some of these kinds of things. They are slowly getting better on their defaults for the portal. The reality is, is a lot of people use ClickOps. They go in the portal to launch stuff, and especially on Azure, because mm -hmm. it's Microsoft has been GUI driven from the start as opposed right, to Amazon right. API driven. And for a long time, um, so Azure's networks default open and everything has internet access and there's no security groups. Hmm. So the portal used to, you would by default, if you launch something through the portal, it would not force you to put a security group on it. Uh, and they, um, they fixed that in the, in the workflow within the portal to go mm -hmm. ahead and do that. Uh, the graph database is interesting. So it's not all bad. I think they, really need to be more open and take more of a security defaults. Um, and I wish Azure would default secure more. That would be a huge step. Uh, I think keeping the documentation more up to date, stuff tends to get pushed in Azure out the door. Uh, and I've really run into issues multiple times where the, the documentation was out of date for what I was trying to do. Yeah, but you must've run into that with AWS as well. Not nearly to the same degree. Yeah. Not nearly to the same degree. Interesting. Uh, I think the biggest thing. Oh, but what I noticed with AWS is they'll update the documentation, but anyone else third party that has written about it is yeah. based on the old documentation. I think that's where I was getting that getting that confused. Yeah. Yeah, and while Amazon tends to default secure more frequently uh, or more consistently, weirdly the documentation is often the examples and documentation are less secure. Agreed. Agreed. So. Yes. Yeah, like the, the service is secure, but the example in the documentation is the less secure way of doing it. Correct. Yeah, so it guides people down that wrong path. So, um, and then, yeah, Azure, there's, yeah, uh, there's just more sharp edges on it. I did also, I wanted to talk about Cognito a little bit. Yeah. Um, is that overkill for a lot of applications? And what are the security benefits oh, or downsides wow. to it? Yeah, we use it. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, and on Azure, I would use B2C or B2B if I could, uh, you know, if that's going to be an option for you, because to me as a security person, so if I'm going in and I'm like taking a look at, a, at, a, at an app team, the stuff that scares me is anytime I'm dealing with authentication, yep. session management, and crypto. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's take crypto out of the equation. Two of the three you can get from Cognito. I right. don't have to be user databases with passwords. I don't have to deal with the authentication protocols. Uh, I don't have to deal with my session management with my JWITs or whatever mm -hmm. mechanism I'm using to maintain secure session states on an asynchronous browser. Like real like low level stuff that's very easy to get wrong. And then if I use Cognito, I get all of that mm -hmm. potentially. Um, it is still possible to misconfigure Cognito for sure. And we've seen that there's some research last year. I can't remember who did it. Uh, and I don't even remember all the details, but it was people like exposing their user data pools because they had misconfigured their, you know, how they were using Cognito. Uh, we've run into issues with, it's really easy to 
mess up how you're using Cognito to back yourself. I was going to say that. It seems like you can configure it and go down a path and then have a new requirement and go, oh, I need to go all the way back and go down a different path. I think that's true of a lot of cloud native services yeah. like that, Rich. Maria, I'm sure you could attest to that. Oh, yeah. Well, we did that. I mean, yeah. on Cognito, like mm -hmm. flat out, that's a mistake that we made. And, and not a mistake. It was just we, it was a combination of Amazon moving us in the wrong direction right the solution architect uh, that we got advice from or mm -hmm. product support or whoever it was and i wasn't involved in the decision but it had to deal with how managing how we do our own user pools one user pool or different user pools for customers or something and i can't I, i'd have to go talk to brandy or cto to get all the details but like at one point we had to do you know the one thing you never want to do which is the big password reset right you had to re because we had to move people into different user pools that was, it's not a password reset, like credentials got compromised. It was a, you know, we had to basically rebuild the, rebuild your account access because of the architectural decision with Cognito. So yeah, um, if anybody wants to, you can hit me up after and I can go, because I don't, I wasn't involved in that. I can go to Brandy and get the details of it. But I remember it was, there was a lot of, a lot of customer communications and timing around that. Um, I want to do the giveaway question and then because it's May the 4th, I want to ask you some Star Wars uh, questions as well in the you last. Uh, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys ready for this? I don't know if they can hear me with this thing on. My headphones are falling off. <laughs> You can tell this is like an exact replica, Rich, right? I don't think anyone can hear me in this one, though. <laughs> barely, barely. <laughs> now, is, is that one you've built? Yeah, I built it. It's awesome. So I've got three here. This is the uh, Stormtrooper for myself. This is a uh, pure. It's actually getting yellowed. I got to go put some chemicals on it to make it white again. Mm. Then uh, if any of you have watched Star Wars Rebels, this is the Sabine I did for my daughter. Oh, very nice. Very this nice. This helmet took longer to do than my entire Stormtrooper costume. Yeah, I'm trying to get the, the colors and the... Yeah, yeah. That's wild. I liked Rebels. So I that was good. I'm going to new one now because she outgrew that one. Mm -hmm. And my other daughter wanted her own style Mandalorian. So Pusheen the Cat. She's Pusheen nice. the Cat Mandalorian. That's awesome. That's awesome. Very cool. Uh, the giveaway question. Uh, so for those in the Discord, make sure in the Discord, securityweekly.com forward slash Discord uh, for all of our, our webcasts. We are doing giveaway questions to win a $100 gift card to Hacker Warehouse. Uh, Rich, you don't answer this because you don't qualify to win uh, the, the gift card. But uh, first person to respond with the correct answer in Discord will win the $100 gift card to Hacker Warehouse. The question is, what's the name of Amazon's fully managed graph database? We'll wait for the answer to come up in, in Discord. Still waiting. Yes. Uh, KGood517 has the correct answer of Neptune. Yeah, I would have gotten that wrong. I forgot. <laughs> you forgot. <laughs> That's hilarious. We, 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 I, we do GraphQL queries. I think we wrote our own in a different framework. Yeah. So it was really funny. I was on vacation with my kids, uh, and we were at Universal, actually. And I carry um, one of those slings when we go to the amusement parks just to carry, you know, some extra rain ponchos and you know, band-aids and various things like that. And it's a Star Wars uh, like little um, uh, sling uh, sack that I carry. And these two guys like came up and they were like, they were like all excited. And they're like, what's your favorite Star Wars movie? Like totally caught me off guard. And I was like, Empire Strikes Back. And they started cheering and high-fiving me. And they were like going up to just random people at the park, asking them a question, having a good time. I thought it was great. So what's your favorite Star Wars movie? Uh, so it, it's torn. I think the best is Empire. We just watched it again. My son, like, he watched them all when he was so young, he forgot them. So we're starting to rewatch yeah. a bunch of them. I think my overall favorite 
thing of Star Wars is Rebels. Interesting. I liked Rebels, yeah. The uh, I think particularly as it got after midway and later in the first season, like to me that really, really showed like the the richness of the that kind of galaxy. Uh, and I think though, you know what? If I just want to, if I want to have a good time, uh, it's it's Jedi. I think Jedi gets knocked. It down does. A lot. The old people knock the Ewoks. I love that stuff as a kid, and I absolutely love it. It's like it's got the happy ending. Of course, then you find out later that you know Han Solo's kid stabs him through the heart, and his well, anyway. But <laughs> right, right. There's all Which the I, I read something that the 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 latest three uh, in the series were just named wrong, like Rise of Skywalker should yeah. have been the first one, and the Last Jedi should have been the last one, and the Force Awakens. Should, they, I forget exactly where, how they renamed them, but they were like, it's just named. They're just all named wrong, and they like rearranged all the names, and I thought it was really funny. <laughs> yeah, I don't hate the new ones. I really enjoyed Force Awakens. Um... I did too. You know, I just posted on Facebook. Uh, we were rewatching Force Awakens with my kids, and I'm like, I really like this as an yeah. like re-entry. I'm like, I thought it was a amazing Star Wars work. I, I think where they just didn't build on it correctly in yeah. the in the latter two. Like I it, like they spent the third one was spent fixing all the mistakes in the second one, uh, in the Last Jedi. I'm like, I they just it's a missed opportunity in my in my opinion. But I think the Force Awakens is a great entry. Yeah, I mean, Last Jedi actually, I think, is an excellent film. Like, a lot of people hate it because it wasn't what they wanted. And I had looked right. at it, and I'm like, you know, we're getting older, dude. And think about your enthusiasm mm. of your youth, and then now how jaded you are. And so, like, Luke going downhill kind of matched my personal journey, just as Luke right. youth was my aspirational personal journey. Right. And so that really spoke to me but i also get that like there's the downer that's not what we wanted to see out of luke yeah but if you think about where i mean it made logical sense it just wasn't what we wanted to see and that's that's yeah. hard you know that's hard right the problem was is i think the jj had one movie to do what he really needed two movies to tell that story the right way Yes. For the last one. And I think Rise of Skywalker could have been, I didn't like the dyad in the forest garbage, but, and the Palpatine thing I even could have lived with. It was right. just executed like they just didn't, he didn't have the breathing space. So it turned into a big fetch quest. And then, um, yeah, they I think tried to they cram too done, much. They crammed too much in the final film. Yeah. And they wanted to put all the Leia stuff in. And I'm like, I, I felt horrific when Carrie Fisher died, but mm. there's a point where they could have let her die. And she didn't no longer was contributing much to the rest of that Agreed. middle film. And I hate to say it, I know they wanted to honor her, and that was their emotions as the filmmakers, I think, that kept mm. her in it. I think they should have let her go. It, as horrible as that was, and it's not how we would have wanted to see that character end up, but it that became, they had to rework everything else around that because the third film was supposed to be her film, and then that just, anyway. Mm. Yeah, there we go. We're out of time, but. We're out of time, yeah. but uh, thank you everyone for listening and watching. Rich, thank you so much uh, for doing this today. It was a lot of fun. And uh, everyone will get uh, an email with the recording and uh, materials and all that stuff. So thanks for joining us. Thanks, Paul.